Hey, what's up everybody? Today we're going to talk about the key things that you need to think about when it comes to living a long and healthy life. I'm Risa Morimoto, your host. I am an integrative nutrition health coach and you're watching Modern Aging where we chat about innovative and holistic ways to elevate our health and well-being as we age. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel by clicking on that little cute red button below with that little bell next to it, as well as checking out our website at thisismodernaging.com. So today my guest is Kathy Richards. She's a wellness and healthy aging coach and we're going to talk about why it's never too early and never too late to live a healthy and long life and it all starts right up here. So check it out. Hi Kathy, thank you so much for joining me today. So why don't we kick it off by starting with how you got into kind of wellness coaching and healthy aging coaching. Well, I started off way back in the day in college and wanting to um, be healthy because I gained freshman 15 way back in college. I was a biology major, so I loved how the human body worked. And so I ended up taking an aerobics class that had lecture in addition to the exercise. And I fell in love with the lecture component of how the human body works. So I changed my major to kinesiology, which is now called exercise science. Um, and then, so it went on from there. I started, I got some certifications in fitness, and then I worked in corporate wellness right out of college for Marriott. And so I really was in, um, plunked into a setting where there were 4,000 people all in one building who were these busy, busy corporate types. And I was just out of college and working in the wellness center and really got an immersion experience in um, helping busy people figure out how they can get healthy. That was kind of my start. Um, and then I also brought in speakers as I was the director of wellness there. And I decided the speakers were had great content, but they didn't have the motivational angle. And that's what I started noticing people really needed. So I started doing some of the talks myself as I got further into my career. And so doing motivational talks on how we can fit in healthy habits started being kind of my specialty area. That's kind of how I got started. So tell me, what is your philosophy? So why, you know, so many of us are so gung ho at the beginning of the year with motivation, and then it quickly kind of just dives. What are some of the things that we can do to kind of keep that motivation up to create those habits that are going to be long lasting and not just temporary for January and February of every year? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so frustrating. And it's, it's all about mindset. And I think it's part of our culture that we are fed these things, whether it's through infomercials or looking at social media, where we think things are supposed to happen really quick. So we have these expectations of all or none or the quick fix. And we, we have this really short attention span where we think we're going to change all these habits and we expect to see something so soon. Versus if you change your mindset to know that, you know what, what works isn't glamorous. It's not fast. And it's and if, if I can think about small changes that I can make now that I can still see myself doing a year from now, that's really where the magic happens. Because if we if we make these huge changes that are ridiculously not sustainable, of course, we're going to stop <laughs> and then start again and stop again and start again. So it's really more about just knowing I'm going to make a couple of changes that I that I'm just going to do just because that's the way I'm going to start living my life and let those snowball into more things and more and to, to bigger changes where you start seeing the benefit down the road versus making a huge change and expecting to see the results tomorrow. And I think that that's probably why, you know, 95% of diets don't work, right? Because yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. may lose 10, 20 pounds, but then we plateau and then we can't figure out what to do. And then we say, screw it. I'm just going to eat the bag of chips and, you know, yeah. forget it. and the cake. Absolutely. And the or even it's that we, we, we lower our calories. Somehow some random number of 1,000 calories a day is ridiculously got out there. And then you, you start, you can't, you can't survive on the number of calories very long. And then your, your body and your hormones tell you to eat, eat, eat. Eventually you're going to do it and you're not going to choose a salad at that point. You know, so I mean, you, you have a lot of systems in your body that are made for survival. And it, you will eat eventually. And when you do, boy you know, you're, you're set up to, to store more as fat as well. So tell me about some of your, you know, you have a whole methodology behind healthy aging and healthy living and wellness. Um, can you kind of go through some of the steps? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, after working in corporate wellness, I worked in senior wellness and I was the director of wellness for a retirement community where the average age was 85. So, average. 
average, can you believe that? The average age is 85. So I was surrounded day in and day out by over 1,400 people who were 85. And so wow. <laughs> you learn a few things, you know, and you start realizing that it's our habits now that are going to determine how healthy we are at 85. You don't wake up one day at 84, 85, and you're either in a nursing home community or you're traveling the world on a cruise. It's it's really the, the, the lack of activity and the changes in our health habits that go gradually are what make us kind of have a lower and lower quality of life and health. So that's why my my whole framework is start now, or my tagline is never too early, never too late, because we want to start now. And if we can build those small habits, then that's going to, to help us age as healthfully as possible. I mean, I also say never too late, because the clients that I have who are in their 80s, and I've worked with people into their 90s, and the human body and the muscles specifically, they respond to exercise and strength training, even at advanced ages, so you can improve your strength, improve your mobility, improve your quality of life with even small things at advanced ages. So I've had people tell me in their 50s, oh, it's too late for me, I'm too old. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> no, you can't tell me you're too old and it's too late for you at 50 or 60, because I can't have people, I won't accept that from someone at 80 or 90 either. So you certainly can't say it at 50 or 60. That's absolutely true. So, um, so what are some of the actual steps that people need to do to make those changes? What do they need to pay attention to? Well, one of the most important things you can pay attention to, the first step, is how much you're moving during the day. And, you know, when we talk about exercise, specifically cardiovascular exercise and strength training, a lot of times people think, okay, if I'm going to exercise on a regular basis, but they're not thinking about all the other 23 hours of the day. So even if you were to exercise a whole hour a day, seven days a week, which is more than most people do or even need to do, okay, that if there's 168 hours in a week, you still have the large percentage of time, 161 hours, if you minus <laughs> seven, to account for metabolically speaking. So especially in the world now where most of us are spending so much time at home, if you're spending all of your time either sitting or lying down, you're losing the ability to increase your metabolism, using the ability to increase your mobility and um, lubrication for your joints and everything. So paying attention to how much you're standing and moving. So I'm a big fan of things like Fitbits or Apple Watches or something where you're kind of counting your steps so that in addition to actual exercise, you are getting yourself more active during the day and you're moving around more. That is hugely important as we age. That will be step number one. That's awesome. I think that that's, you know, just the little things, right? Getting people out of their chair because mm -hmm. that's the first thing that we almost lose, right? Is the kind of like mm -hmm. the muscle mass as we're getting older. I believe it's like 3% every decade or 1% every year or some. There's some sort of statistic that, Yes, and you know, there's there's a lot of statistics, and the one that sticks in my mind that's easiest to remember is that between the ages of 20 and 80, the average person loses 50% of their leg strength. Ooh. So, yes, that's a huge amount. So you only have half the strength in that 60-year span. You lose that much, but you still have the same body weight typically. So if you had half the leg strength to carry around your body, imagine what it feels like. Or you sometimes you have more body weight. That's right. Sometimes you have more body weight. So you're losing muscle mass. And so if you were going to walk around, it's like carrying a second one of yourself on piggyback all day long, everywhere you go. And that is going to make you tired. It's going to wear out your joints. You're going to need to stop and take a break when you are walking just from here to the car. So the, the, so the next best thing we can do when you're talking about steps is strength training. I am a huge fan of strength training. It's, I call it the secret weapon, especially for women. Most women aren't doing strength training. And so I really am encouraging all of my clients to do even a small amount of strength training because that's going to help you age as healthfully as possible to, to include that in your regular routine. It doesn't have to be a lot. Again, it doesn't have to be with a lot of equipment and it, it can be just short little routine. So what, so what do you mean by strength training? Are you meaning like, you know, I think people 
that's the other thing that kind of intimidates people is they think of strength training and they think they have to be doing barbells and there are, you know, they have to be doing uh, yeah. whatever, you know, they have to be doing 50 push-ups or, you know, I, it's the same. I, I have a, a, the other philosophy that, that is really important to me is, is really getting away from the all or none. So if, when I say strength training, yes, there are people who love strength training and do it as a hobby and might be doing, you know, dumbbells and, full weights and three sets per muscle group and they go through this whole rigmarole or go to the gym. But even if you were to pick one muscle group, one exercise, like your abdominals, let's say start with your abdominal muscles. And and if you were to do a plank, which is going to be appropriate for some people and for other people, they might be doing a crunch that they're sitting in the chair because they need a more gentle exercise. And that could do one exercise and it would take less than two minutes a day. And then if it, in my perfect world, If you were going to do a little bit more, you'd also do an exercise for your legs, which could be as simple as um, for someone who is an older adult who has less muscle mass already doing a chair stand where they sit to stand, Um, you know, do that every day when when they take their medications. So anything that that challenges your muscles and is going to make them stronger, um, it could be you you could start with just one or two exercises and um, you might graduate to doing six or eight exercises. And you might do them with exercise tubing and a ball and dumbbells at home, which is very inexpensive. Or if you really like it, you might have more equipment or you might go to a gym. I feel like there's also these indicators. And I know that you've mentioned like, you know, the moment you start to need to use the arms of a chair to get up, it's an indicator that you really need to start working out <laughs> yes absolutely that's yeah that you yeah it's a time you've already lost a significant amount of muscle mass if you can't get out of a chair without using your arms so and that's one of the things that you'll notice it, it when if you are especially in a couch if someone is sitting in a big soft couch and they feel like they need to use their arms to push themselves off of the chair then that means that you've lost a significant amount of, of leg strength already and there's a test which is part of the what's called the senior fit test, where you do scoot to the end of a chair, cross your arms in front of your chest, and stand up and sit down as many times as you can in 30 seconds to to find out if your leg strength is already at a a high risk uh, rate. So if you were to sit at the end of your chair and try to stand up and you can't even stand up once without using your arms, then you've already lost a significant amount of leg strength. So how many times should you be able to get up? Without using well, the arms, for for someone to be in the high risk category, um, when they're in uh, over seventy or eighty, would be if you can't do it ten times. So you can imagine that if you can't even do it once, that you really are in a high risk range. It would be time to to, to start um, definitely start some strength training, and you can see improvements in just a short period of time. Right. So I think that's also the myth, right? That once we lose the muscle mass, that we can never gain it back. So that's why I feel like a lot of people think it's a lost cause. Oh, it's so far, so much not a lost cause. The human body can build muscle at any age. It's, and that's a, a, that's the myth, I though. That's the amazing thing about it, right? That mm-hmm. you can. It is. Yeah, the, the body responds. The other myth is that people think muscle turns to fat. I, you hear that phrase a lot. That, and, but what really happens is that if you had a, a certain amount of muscle mass, from a lot of activity when you were younger, and then you become less active, the muscles are going to shrink. And as the muscles get, get smaller, your metabolism does slow down so that if you're still eating the same amount, you're going to put on weight and the weight you're going to put on is going to be fat. So yes, your fat levels increase and your muscles are getting smaller, but one is never turning into the other. <laughs> right. Muscle is always muscle, fat is always fat. But you can build your muscles at any stage and you can increase your fat or decrease your fat at any stage as well. So when people are doing strength training, are they oftentimes also just decreasing their fat? Yes, they are because when you are, when you, the more muscle you have, the more metabolically active you are all day long. You're going to burn more calories all day long. So most people, when they start strength training, they also do see a reduction in their overall fat. It's also they see reduction in their in, in the way we measure it because when we measure, we, it's called percent body fat. So you're you're measuring the ratio of fat to muscle in your body. So if you're increasing the muscle, the percentage of fat to your overall body weight is going to go down. So you really can't lose. You you get the benefits from a lot of different angles there. 
And so it's not only building your muscles, but then of course you have increased energy and, you know, just vitality and, um, oh, yeah. just, your joints are better. Your joints are more protected. You're going to have less back pain. You're going to definitely have more energy. And that's, that's the, the, the wonderful thing is that, um, when we look at the different habits that we can change, that are small habits that they usually sometimes hit a variety of benefits. I call exercise the magic pill because in one thing, exercise can impact more areas of our life in, you know, in, in more ways than any other single thing we can do. So when you start exercising or increase the amount of exercise you're doing, you're not only going to um, increase your muscle and lose fat, you're also going to sleep better. It's going to help you lose weight. You're going to have, your mood's going to be better, decrease your risk of dementia. You're going to, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So it's really, exercise is truly a magic, magical thing. Yeah, and I think that once you start to create it's like a bad habit, right? If you create the good habit, once it becomes habit, it's easier to do. And then you start looking forward to it and it, it's not hard. But I do know that, you know, for a lot of people, it's such a hurdle, right? Or it feels very daunting to kind of do those exercises because I get so sore. So do you have any thoughts in terms of how people could kind of overcome those initial hurdles to create mm -hmm. those, to make sustaining habits? Yeah, I think that the most important thing is to start small. And it's true that when you start something new, your muscles will be a little sore, right, in the beginning. And, and But that's kind of the, the price to be paid in the beginning of the first couple of workouts. But you don't want to overdo it too much. So you start small, just with a little, something that feels challenging but, but not really hard. And you always want to make sure that it's not your joints that are feeling the strain that it's you feel strain in your muscles when you're doing something so the doing the proper form and just doing a little and then knowing that in advance you're going to be a little sore but that you, you once you get past that the soreness will subside and you'll be able to keep going but it's really still all about not doing too much just starting small um and you know, how, just, how small is small small can be one or two exercises that take less than five minutes that can be small uh, and then you can build it up to, to doing a, a routine that's three or four exercises that takes 20 minutes a couple times a week. Um, but you don't even have to build up. What I, um, I have some clients who really and truly just have one or two exercises they do three times a week that takes less than five minutes. And they never increase to more than that. And a lot of times the, the problem is that, that we – people feel guilty that they're not increasing and they're not doing more. And they think if I'm not going to do <clears throat> a lot, I might as well do nothing at all. And so we don't want to have that all or none attitude. We want to realize that even a little bit helps. But what happens is that it, it goes into your head. And once you are doing a little, you start perking up when you hear other ideas and you kind of want to do a little more. So one of my favorite sayings is that habit is more important than content. So the what that you're doing in the beginning it doesn't even matter as much as the fact that you're doing something and you're kind of enjoying it and you're, you're, you have a little routine where you're planning to, to, to do it again and um, through, through some continuity. And then the content will grow and evolve over time. So many people worried about, well, I heard that if you're not going to mix up the exercises, you might as well not bother. Well, if you're not doing a comprehensive routine, you're not doing stretching and cardio and strength, you might as well not bother. You know, you might be someone who enjoys stretching or yoga, and that's okay not to do cardio or strength training right now because it's because it's better than doing nothing. And maybe down the line, you'll be ready to add a little cardio or strength training. That's great. That's so awesome. Um, so, what are some of the other? What about nutrition? What are your thoughts about nutrition? My thoughts on nutrition are that it's the same as exercise. People are in this all or none world, <laughs> and we're, we're either eating clean or we're just like throwing caution to the wind and eating whatever we want, where um, the best strategy is to pick a couple of small changes that you're still willing to do that you know we are, we all know what's healthy and what's not. I'm not a subscriber to any, any big diet. I don't think that we should be doing a huge big changes or, you know, trying to avoid entire huge um, um, food groups. But rather, one of the best things that we can do is use a free, like a free, um, app like my fitness pal where you were to if you were to track what you eat 
even for a couple of days, most people would find their eyeballs would shoot wide open and you'd be like, oh my goodness, now I really know what I'm eating and how it's stacking up. So that investment of a couple of days, and that's what I used to do with, with my clients, is I have them do just a couple of days of a food diet. So you can kind of see, hmm, how much am I getting of fruits and vegetables versus protein versus too much salt or too much sugar? And then you kind of are able to make some informed decisions and say, okay, now that I know what I'm eating, what's one or two small changes that I'm willing to make that might be a little bit healthier that I can still see myself doing down the line from now? And then just still, again, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. Yeah, I think that food addiction is a hard one for a lot of people. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, people who are addicted to sugar or, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, even a lot of people drinking more than they should right now because of the pandemic. Um, how do we wean ourselves off of, you know, because I, I, I subscribe to the same philosophy as you do that sometimes cold turkey. I mean, some people have to do cold turkey, otherwise they can't do it at all. But I do subscribe to the kind of, you know, try to substitute good habits for the bad habits. And mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, you wean out some of the bad habits a little bit more. Um, yeah. But for those people who are, you know, I don't know, obsessed with carbs or obsessed with yeah. sugar, um, how can they decrease that in a sustainable, in a way that's really going to work? Yeah. And you're right. It is tricky because we all need food. So a lot of times people do like to compare it to alcohol or alcoholism. And so, yes, with alcohol, someone can decide to go cold turkey and not have any. But with food, you're, you're never going to say, I'm just, you know, I can't eat. So, but I do agree that there are some people who, who have some foods that they like to decide, you know what, I'm just going to abstain from a certain food because I know once I have one that um, I'll have too much. And I have that with trail mix. <laughs> so, like, I can't eat trail mix because I know if I do, I'll eat too much. That, that would, you know, be the thing, you know, so... Um, but we have a lot of ways to get around things like that. You have to, you have these things that you weigh, like how much of a favorite is it? Is it something that is a, that you can make available to you only in small doses? You know, there are certain things that I won't keep in my house because I know I, I, I can't be trusted near them to not eat the whole thing in a really crazy amount of time. So, um, but other foods I'm okay having in the house because I'm, I'm able to be a they say, are you a moderator with this certain food or do you need to be an abstainer? Can you, you know, and so you kind of need to make that decision, I think, for, for different food groups. I do like to recommend the superfoods. I like to use that phrase superfoods, which are certain foods that are so high in nutrients and so good for you that the more you pack your, your daily diet with those, it leaves less opportunity for the, the less uh, virtuous foods. So these are things like uh, fruits and vegetables and lentils and you know, things like sweet potatoes, broccoli, the, the, the foods that are so good for us. And when we have enough protein and we're eating frequently during the day, we're going to have less of those cravings. So that's one of the things that is, it is a good trick there is that you mentioned carbs. Um, it, it, carbs uh, beget more carbs. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. It's funny because yeah. I used to eat toast every morning and then I kind of stopped. And now I'm at the point where I don't miss it at all and I don't want it. And if I don't start my day with like toast and carbs or whatever, I will eat less of it during the day. It's amazing. Yes. But if I do, I will. It's a cascading effect. Right. And then I, before I know it, I'm having like this huge thing of spaghetti and then I'm having this, huge, you know, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for me is what works. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, which leads me to mindset and how critical it is and how if without the mindset component, right, nothing, it's really hard to be successful. Um, Absolutely. it's kind of, you're just fighting a losing battle. I feel like in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Um, so what are some of the things that people can employ in terms of their mindset to help them with the exercise, to help them with the nutrition, to help them with, you know, um, everything else. I feel like it just starts here first. It does. So it starts in the head. It ends in the head. In the head. And so when, when we talked earlier about some of the mindsets that you want to get rid of, 
like the all or none and the quick fix. And also there's pessimism where you think, oh, it didn't work before. It's not going to work now. I've never been athletic. Um, those are the things that we, we need to get rid of. The other thing that I, I really like to um, encourage is thinking about positive thinking and, and, and what you can do to increase that just about your habits in general. I like to compare our minds to a garden. Like if you think about your brain as a garden and what are you planting there? Like are you purposely planting beautiful flowers or fragrant herbs or delicious vegetables or is your garden, you know, going to be subject to whatever seeds are blown in the wind? You know, you want to purposely plant in your mind what it is you want to think about. And then you're going to need to, to, you know, what do you do when you have a garden? You go in there and you pull out the weeds, right? You make sure that you are watering it. You, so you want, to, you want to water. The other phrase I love is what you focus on grows. So if you're focusing on all the good things, if you're planting good thoughts in your brain, if you're nurturing the good thoughts, and if you're, telling your, if, if you're taking the negative thoughts and saying, you know what, I'm just not going to focus on that. I have a little sticky note that I post next to my desk. Um, it says, I'm landlord of my mind, and I don't allow a bad tenant. That's awesome. And so I'm not, a, I'm not you know, an expert at positive thinking, because if I was, I wouldn't need to have that sticky note <laughs> on my desk. So, but I do know that, um, so I journal in the mornings. I think journaling is a wonderful thing that, that if you start your day, I don't do it for long, just five minutes about, you know, what, my, what I, I want to do for the day. And also what I'm, um, I do a little, a, a gratitude, a three step, you know, what are three things I'm grateful for, which is a pretty, you know, something a lot of people do too. That's so great. And that's, again, you know, creating healthy habits for you so that you set yourself. I meditate every single morning. I think it's similar and kind of creating a, a specific mindset um, for your day uh, to put your, you know, put the right foot forward. So when the setbacks happen, you know. Um, how to basically combat it or, you know, you're kind of of a clearer mindset as opposed to being reactionary. And I feel like sometimes when we're so negative, you know, we can go, we can go down that rabbit hole and get more negative and then it starts to affect every single spiral. aspect of our life. Yeah. Yeah. It's a spiral. And so it's, it's really helpful when we recognize that things are cyclical that we're not always going to be in the in a great mood every day. We're not always going to be, um, you know, on point with our our eating and our exercise. So it, so we can tend to, to be so hard on ourselves and our own worst enemy. Like you know, like who's in our way but us? You know. So we we don't need to have such um, rigid expectations. We want to we want to have habits that are our goals that are realistic and reasonable and then have some room for, to, you know, to be human too. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so key in terms of just forgiving yourself. Right. And not, mm -hmm. um, you know, hitting ourselves over the head because we had that carrot cake or whatever it may be. I think that we just need to give ourselves a break a little bit. Well, we really do. And, and also, and so many of us do use food as comfort. So if someone finds that, you know, they really are an emotional eater, number one, you definitely don't want to beat yourself up for it because that just makes it worse. Where are you going to comfort yourself from beating yourself up? Is back in the Snickers again, right? So, um, but, but to also look at what are the other options you might have available to you that, that are also places that you could um, get comfort that are different than, than, than food and kind of setting yourself up for um, habits. Like for me, it's, it's music. So there are, and some people I know have different playlists that they have for, you know, when they need to get pepped up and what's going to put you in a good mood um, that, that might be different than the snack cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I know that you have some things that you um, recommend that some of the people, I guess you have something that people can sign up for on your website. Yeah, I do. Um, I have, um, an online course that runs multiple times a year that is called Boom, uh, Fat Loss and Forever Fit. And it is a 30-day course that is designed to help women especially get their habits set over a 30-day period, both in their mindset and in their exercise routine. Find the exercise routine that's reasonable for them 
that they can um, implement and stick with forever, not all or none. And so they can find out about that at kathyrichards.net forward slash 2021. And then I also have at kathyrichards.net forward slash free, um, some, some free downloads on tips uh, that you can use to get yourself on a healthier path.